Of course, my son couldn't drive a car, but he certainly could have made an effort to arrange transportation alternatives, and in the process, learn to take some responsibility. Reliving that situation made me realise how easily we needlessly pick up other people's monkeys in all arenas of life. In the process, we neglect our own monkeys, and make other people dependent upon us, and deprive them of opportunities to learn to solve their own problems. In retrospect, I can better understand the statements of General George C. Marshall, who said, If you want someone to be there for you, never let him feel he is dependent on you. Make him feel that you are in some way dependent on him. And Benjamin Franklin, who said, The best way to convert a friend into an enemy is to get him indebted to you. As I reviewed my luncheon discussion with the one-minute manager, I realised he was concerned that I had become a rescuer, someone who was doing for others what they could do for themselves, and in the process giving them the message that they were not okay. He told me that every time one of my people came to me and shared a problem, and I took the monkey away from that person, what I was saying in essence was, you're not capable of handling this problem, so I had better take care of it myself. The one minute manager said I was by no means alone in what I was doing. In fact, he implied it was almost becoming a disease in our country. He even had contemplated starting an organisation called Rescuers Anonymous for people who were compulsive monkey picker-uppers. It would be a gathering of do-gooders, very loving people who were running around trying to help others, but who were crippling those they were trying to help by making them dependent. He said we have an almost institutionalised rescuing in our government and throughout our society. Then the one-minute manager illustrated the depth of the rescuing mentality in this country by telling me his example of Little League. I can almost hear him now. When I was young, if we wanted to play baseball, we had three problems. First of all, we needed equipment. In those days, the one thing that guaranteed you would play was having a bat. There just weren't that many bats available. And if your bat broke, you'd never even think about running home and asking your parents to buy you a new one. Instead, you'd pound a few nails in it and wrap it with tape. I'll never forget running down to first base with my hands vibrating from one of those broken bats. I also didn't know a baseball was white until I was nine. That's when we got our first TV. All the balls we used were covered with black tape. In fact, sometimes with a large ball, you didn't know whether it was a softball or really a hardball that just had so much tape around it that it was the size of a softball. I just knew that some of the balls were so heavy that if you could hit a fly ball to the shortstop, that was considered a long hit. And gloves, the one-minute manager continued, we didn't have that many then, and I wasn't from a poor neighbourhood. I can never remember running in from the field to bat when I didn't throw my glove to someone coming out to field. Today I know kids who have two or three different gloves. Once we got our equipment, the second problem was finding a place to play. If you lived in the city, you'd find a city block that didn't get much traffic and where residents could park their cars elsewhere. Then you would use the sewers, hydrants and the like for bases. If you lived in the country, as I did, you found a vacant lot or a farmer's field where you could clear off all the rocks except the four you were going to use for bases. The third and last problem, once we had equipment in the field, said the one-minute manager, was to find kids to play. Since we rarely had an abundance of kids, we had to choose from what was available. As a result, a team would range in age all the way from 7 or 8 to 18. I had real heroes when I was a kid. I remember that if Harry Haig even said hello to me when I was a kid, I was thrilled. If he asked me to go right field on defence, I never complained. Not even when a left-handed batter came up and we shouted for me to get into left field. I never ran home and told my parents I wasn't playing enough. I just knew if I was patient, when I got older, I would get to pitch, catch or play third base. After we had equipment, a field and kids, we started hitting the ball around and playing choose-up games. Pretty soon, we started thinking we were real good. Then someone would say, I understand Keith Dollar has a group that plays ball in his neighbourhood. So someone would see Dollar in school and challenge his team to a game. We'd play and beat them and then someone else would say, I understand Bill Bush has a group. So we'd challenge them and beat them. We ended up having a six-team league when I was a kid. And the Berrien Bombers, the Seacord Sissies, the Aberfoyle Asses, and others like them. But who did all the planning? We did. Who did all the organising? We did. And the motivating and controlling? We did, exclaimed the one-minute manager. And who does it today? The parents. All the kids have to do is get dressed. And do they get dressed? They all look like Joe DiMaggio or Willie Mays. And it's not just baseball. It's all youth sports. 
I remember working with a top manager in a Canadian company last year. In the middle of the afternoon, he asked if I minded taking a drive with him to pick up his son so he could take him to youth hockey. We drove to his home and tooted the horn. The door opened and a kid came staggering out, just loaded down with equipment. He was obviously a goalie. I asked, how old is he, since I couldn't tell. Seven, was the answer. Halfway down the sidewalk, the kid tripped and fell. If we hadn't gotten out of the car and helped him up, he would have died there. With all that equipment on, there was no way he could have gotten up by himself. I remember playing hockey as a kid on the lake in front of the high school, said the one-minute manager. We would spend all afternoon clearing the snow off the lake. Then just about the time we were finished and we were ready to play, our mums would come by and tell us to come home for dinner. That night it would snow again, and we'd have to start clearing again the next day. When we finally got the ice cleared, we'd put two rocks at the end of our rink to mark the goals, and if you played goalie then and even hinted that you were wearing a jock, they would call you a sissy. After the kids get dressed today, they get driven to the games. No one would want them to get any exercise. Once they get to the game, there there are incredible fields with a refreshment stand where mothers and fathers are sweating, preparing hot dogs and hamburgers and all kinds of goodies. We certainly wouldn't want the kids to be hungry. Then there are parents sitting in the stands with Major League scorebooks scoring the game. When a kid hits one to third and a fielder throws him out, the poor parent has to figure what to write down, as if this were the World Series. In the outfield there is a kid, sweating like mad, changing the scoreboard. When we were kids we kept score on the ground with a stick. One of the opponents would come over and say, you didn't get that run, and would rub it out with his foot, and then you'd have to push him aside and scratch it in again. And the final straw, said the one-minute manager, when the game is over today, you lose. You can't even hassle the opponent. You have to go to Baskin-Robbins or haagen for ice cream. Have you ever tried to get ice cream on a Saturday afternoon? Every kid in town is there, legions of little future major leaguers, yelling for some ice cream. As parents, we have taken all the next moves away from our kids. As a result, all the monkeys are on our backs, and the kids don't learn responsibility. In our well-intentioned desire to give them the good things we didn't have, we sometimes neglect to give them the good things we did have. Often kids today don't know what to do if nothing is planned, emphasised the one-minute manager. When I was a kid, if I told my mother I was bored, she would either give me a good swift kick in the pants and say, how's that for a little excitement? Or say, that's great, go and clean out the garage. We'd sure get over our boredom quickly.